I hope you are able to see the uh, screen now. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. yes. Sorry for the initial glitch. Um, so this is the topic of uh, the talk today, research, development, and intellectual property rights and the technology transfer. So um, what is uh, research and development? in this context that we are talking about. We all know about uh, the PhD research that we are carrying out in CET. We also know about the thesis work which our students carry out as a part of their uh, master's program. We also know about certain sponsored researches that our faculty member is carrying, faculty members are carrying out with the help of sponsoring agencies. So all these have a potential of developing certain technology, which could be a product or a process or a design or an artifact. So these are the rewards of our research. And how do we utilize this research? That is the challenge that we have to uh, address and face. For instance, uh, we get a project from, let us say, um, our uh, Dr. Ajit Prabhu's organization, which is KCST, carrying out an engineering research program. So it's okay that you carry out the research, you generate a lot of data, we carry out certain modeling, but what after that? Unless you relate it to an industrial problem and solve an industrial problem, it doesn't become of use to the society. So our means, our means as well as end should be to reach that kind of a scenario. And in doing so, it's quite likely that we make an invention which may be useful to the society. And that is the purpose of R&D, if you ask me. And uh, technology is the very, very core of this research and center. And it involves the basic inputs that are required in the manufacture or production of goods and services in a business environment. So all this uh, encompass the technology. In fact, uh, in some countries like uh, European uh, Union, many countries, they, they don't call it research and development. They call it research and technology development. The technology is at the core of the whole thing. It could be a hardcore, hard technology, which means there could be a machinery, an artifact or equipment that comes out. Uh -huh. Or it could be a soft technology, which means know-how, information, uh, algorithms, etc. Uh, unless these technologies meet the end objectives, it cannot result in a product or process as we originally envisaged. This requires uh, engineering, this requires the function, the natural sciences, that the physics or chemistry or whatever is underlying it, the social sciences, because unless its use or utility is uh, properly defined, it cannot have any meaning. Just by having a theorem or a computer modeling will not help us. An industrial practice, that means there should, should be amenable to manufacture, it should be amenable to marketing, it should be amenable to revenue generation. And uh, it should follow certain ethics and codes that are required in business practice also. So as I mentioned, uh, we can have uh, technology for the purpose of a product or a service or a pro process. And the management technology is the knowledge used to manage the operation of an organization. Well. Uh, I do not want to go into too many details of this technology because we have to get into the patent very soon. However, we should realize as engineers who are carrying out research that it's not only an experiment or a computer uh, modeling that is required for development of technology. It also requires a human part. For instance, there are certain skill sets that may be attributed in generating a project or a product that will be the end use. So probably how you wind a certain um, coil, 
in a particular fashion may be what determines the product's uh, unique quality. So that means a human element is involved. Um, assuming that there is a manual element in the manufacturing process. In fact, there are many advanced um, devices which still make use of manual uh, component. I do not want to get into that. Um, secondly, we also need to know that generating this technology and the subsequent com uh, commercialization have been the core reason why many advanced countries are what they are today. So let us look at some statistics here. The relation between the research and development and its outcome. Israel is currently leading among all the nations in the spending of R&D in terms of GDP. It doesn't mean that the entire amount is uh, spent by the government. It could be the industry, the corporates, or other venture capitalists who are providing this funding, but still uh, close to 5%, 4.9% is contributed by Israel. I still wanted to go down, look at who is next. Again, another small country, South Korea, is leading with 4.81 percentage of its GDP contributing to the research and development. Third is again a small country, Switzerland, Sweden, Japan, Austria, Germany. They are all relatively small countries and that also may explain why this percentage is high. Uh, maybe ninth position USA is the one which is in the first uh, 10 bracket. I still wanted to go down to see where China is because that is one of the most talked about country in terms of R&D spent. And they are spending close to 2.2. Now you may like to ask me, where is India? India is spending around 8.85 percentage of national GDP in R&D. You may think it is very small, but in terms of absolute amount, it is not so small. Look at this. China's absolute amount is 553 billion US dollars. And that's because even though it is spending only 2.2, its GDP is so large that its contribution is the highest. USA is next with 511. Japan is 165. Germany is 118 billion US dollars. South Korea is 91 and India is sixth position even though it doesn't hold high ranking in the percentage of GDP spending, the absolute amount that India spends in R&D, globally speaking, is not very small. Now, this is only for academic interest. If you, if you convert this into amount per capita, you'll find that India is small, but that's also due to the fact that we are a largely populated country and uh, the equality uh, among the economic strata of our population is not good and which explains why it is only 39. Why I said all this is because there is a scope for conversion of good R&D to industry which can generate a lot of revenue and uh, wealth creation for a nation. So look, let's look at uh, what are the major national funding organizations in India. So the Department of Science and Technology at the Government of India is um, not only tasked with uh, policy making as well as creating an ecosystem for national funding. It's also one of the largest funding organizations as far as uh, funding academic and research institutions are concerned in India. And the Department of Biotechnology is next. The difference between uh, the D Department of Science and Technology and probably all other departments which are funding projects is that that's the only department in the system which doesn't have any bias towards any discipline or domain. It could be medicine, it could be engineering, it could be in engineering itself, it could be 
um, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, electronic engineering, computer engineering, civil engineering, and science, chemistry, physics, pure fundamental physics, fundamental chemistry, basic uh, biology, all these are funded by But here they look at the life science related technologies. Even though it is called biotechnology, it is not limited to one aspect. The entire life science and how it can be uh, benefited for creating new technologies. Can you all mute your. Uh, yeah, thank you. And the Department of Electronics and Information Technology will be of a lot of interest to the electronics as well as electrical departments. Um, it gives a lot of funding for projects related to this field. And um, apart from all this, there are organizations like Department of Space, Department of Atomic Energy, DRDO, the Defense Research and Development Organization, which have their own research program within their um, gambit, but still a lot of uh, research projects are being given to the engineering institutions, IITs, universities, et cetera. And I'm sure that uh, CET is also a recipient of some research programs from ISRO. Similarly, atomic energy. In fact, atomic energy has a specific program called BRNS, that is Board of Research for Nuclear Sciences which have, uh, it's totally devoted for extramural that funding. Extramural funding means funding given to outside institutions. So you submit projects of uh, interest to them. It need not be purely atomic energy per se. It could be something related to a mechanical system or an electrical system, a control system. It can have some uh, distant or near use for the nuclear energy generation. Similarly, defense and uh, defense development organization, research development organization, they also fund large number of projects to outside organizations uh, in areas of their interest as well as outside. Now, there are a few other organizations which fund extramural research, that is fund extramural, as I told you, is research funded outside the organization. The other one is called intramural, that is within the organization. So CSIR, you all know, Center for Scientific and Research, uh, Industrial Research, which has a unit uh, in Trivandrum itself. Recently, it was in the news for uh, some a few scientists within that organization being listed um, in international journals as top scientists. ICMR, now in big news, thanks to the pandemic, um, Indian Council for Medical Research, they have been the core of uh, dealing with the scientific and other aspects of the COVID-19. ICAR, Indian Council for Agriculture Research and Corporates. This is a large embodiment of uh, funding opportunities within the country. In addition to this, I know that CET has access to the SARD program, which is, um, I think, uh, managed by KTU, as well as the research programs of uh, our KCST, Kerala State Council for Science and Technology. Uh, these also can be uh, accessed by our people for carrying out research. Sorry. Now, coming to that, um, So there is a need for harnessing this funding towards improvement and uh, advancement in research for PhD, MTech, as well as our uh, industry interactive projects within CET. And as I mentioned to you, industry interaction is the pivotal strategy for innovative products development. And we should have a conscious effort to generate intellectual property, which is the key to progress. 
and what is ip or intellectual property everybody is talking about ip it uh, refers to certain distinct types of creations of mind which gets translated to a, a, a artifact or a process or a product now it covers for example music literature art that is intellectual property you would have seen that uh, music comes with a copyright or it comes with the intellectual property rights the writers of a music writers of a song is the lyrics writer and the music director nobody can copy it if you can copy if you copy it you can be sued for that and recently you would have heard the ile raja trying to uh, music director ile raja trying to sue some singers including our uh, late sp bala subramaniam for singing outside without his permission and of course later he withdrew it that's a different issue um, so that means there is a right uh, available to them for doing that copyright in literature usually copyright in india for example if i have written a novel or a, a non fiction i have a copyright assigned to myself and uh, until 60 years of the death of the author the copyright belongs to him after that it becomes a public property and uh, similarly discovery invention symbols that we design uh, that we generate designs and patents will come to that later industrial trademarks design rights design it could be industrial design or it could be engineering design these are all patentable items and then lastly trade secrets now uh, an, an ip or intellectual property every product has certain intellectual property attached to it you can claim if it is new and it has got some features which are attached to it but let's take a case of a, a camera now you can have a patent the camera for an improved mechanism of working or a better resolution better speed a sports camera which can run which can capture pictures at very high speeds or the design design means the outer shape the way the body is designed or the trademark the brand name the copyrights that are attached to the instruction manual very often you will see that the instruction manuals of many products also have a copyright attached to it okay so that's as far as the camera is concerned you think of another example had it been an interactive session i would have asked this question and you could have answered this think about it we will talk about it at the end of this talk now the purpose now you may ask why this intellectual property law is required in fact uh, i have a lot of friends who have asked me isn't it uh, kind of uh, discretional that you are giving intellectual everybody is uh, working hard somebody is creating something so it should be available to the society at large why should it be a property of one organization or one person the answer to that is that this is provided as a give and take you are disclosing certain information to the society through the patent office which can be read by everybody and learned so that it can be reproduced at a later stage when the patent duration is completed that's the purpose of the property in the intellectual property now there are many examples wherein you would see that uh, many uh, products after their 20 years of patent life has been utilized by lot many other countries lot many other uh, industries in different countries and uh, this benefited society like anything many medicines which originally let's say would cost 100 rupees a tablet after the patent is over becomes only 10 rupees a tablet that's that has happened because the original inventor has disclosed his invention so this is the purpose of uh, intellectual property law so that he is also the person who has uh, generated the invention also benefits and others the society also 
benefits from this. So in addition to that, WIPO, WIPO stands for the Intellectual Property, World Intellectual Property Organization. They have also mentioned that each country must have a law so that it gives an economic right or moral right for the creator of that uh, patent or the IP rights for the creations. And secondly, it's also a government policy to incentivize people to come out with more number of such patents because then it becomes economically uh, wealth creating activity. So uh, as you all know, patent essentially is one of the one of the major IPs in the entire uh, stream of things and it encompasses primarily an invention. We'll go to the details of this a little later. The other form of IP is a trademark. Trademark, you would know, everybody is familiar with BATA, you know, the way that BATA is written. The moment from distance, you can make out, okay, this is BATA. The way the Sony is written or Nike, which has got a particular uh, picture attached to it. So these are all trademarks and this cannot be copied by another organization, another product or another company. So that becomes a right for him. It's also intellectual right. Now, another interesting uh, IP is the geographical indication. It means certain product or certain artifacts which are particular to any region. And uh, it cannot be copied by another region, the same name. Uh, typical examples, one is Darjeeling tea. You have all heard about it. I can make uh, a tea in Munar or somewhere else, similar to Darjeeling tea, but I cannot send it as Darjeeling tea because it carries that geographic indication. Similarly, Kanchipuram silk or Basmati rice, for example. In fact, there was a big case in the US that somebody started cultivating a rice very similar to the Basmati rice uh, made in uh, India and tried to call it uh, Basmati. And it was, he was sued. And later on, he changed it to Taxmati because it was cultivated in Texas. So he called it Taxmati. And even that also had to be withdrawn at a later stage. That is. Uh, uh, the power of uh, having a geographical indication. And uh, um, right home here, we have got uh, RN Nula mirror, or this uh, the new rice, Navara rice. All these things are associated with Kerala also. And copyright, as I mentioned to you earlier, it, it relates to either a work of art. Incidentally, copyright is also assigned to a software. A software or a program coding cannot be patented. However, you can hold a copyright on that. Industrial design. Industrial design, as you all know, um, consists of the way a product appears, the visual aspects of the product. It could be also combined with ergonomics. For example, a telephone. The way the telephone is designed is such a way that you can hold it without any particular uh, strain on your hands. I'm talking about the land phone because all the mobile phones look more or less similar. The handles, handles of various utensils. These are all industrial designs. And uh, sometimes it is, at, it is combined with utility also. The, you would have seen the sports shoes, the way they are shaped. It's also meant to look nice. At the same time, it serves a purpose also. And one of the other um, IP is related to plant breeders. Right, this is more uh, relevant to an agriculturist. You can breed plant and hold right on that. Now, coming back to our patent, I, I told you that I will explain it a little more. There are three very distinctive characteristics for an invention. 
One is novelty. Novelty means something new, something you did not expect. And uh, in other words, lack of anticipation. It has to be not expressed before by anyone else. Second is the non-obviousness or inventive step. It is not enough that it is new, but it should be something very different from what was there earlier. Just because it is new and, uh, for example, I can think of uh, a car which has got five wheels. It is something new because nobody has seen a car with five wheels. But there is nothing new about it. And lastly, utility, industrial application. It, not only that it should be new and uh, inventive, it should have some use to the society, to the industry. The earlier example of car itself, you take a car with five wheels. It has no utility at all. It doesn't serve any purpose. So it will not pass these three. So any patent that you are applying for in the name of a product that you have developed must pass through all the three gates. Only then the patent will be awarded. Even it may have a utility or industrial application, but doesn't have novelty, you will not get it. Now, once while you uh, apply for the patent, you must very clearly mention the unity of invention means, uh, uh, I, I'll explain it a little later. That means it has to have an embodiment of uh, certain features which are required for meeting this novelty aspect. It should also be sufficiency of disclosure means it should also explain everything very clearly without ambiguity. And that then only you will have the clarity of claims attached to it. So as I mentioned to you, novelty means something not known earlier. So the phrase used by the patent people is prior art. Prior art means an art or artifact known earlier prior. So everything that has been published before or disclosed in the form of a publication or a talk or a conference, all this becomes prior art. So it will not get patented. So what is the importance of this in our engineering college, CET, if you ask me? You're all doing research. And it may have a patent component in it, patent potential in it. But if you go and present this particular feature in a conference, that means you already disclosed it. Then when you go to the patent office, he can always find out from a word search that this has already found place in a conference publication. So you miss that boat. So that is why it's important that you should not disclose it prior to patent filing. Second is the inventive step, second feature. So that uh, also is very important. See, um, it, as I mentioned to you, this should be known obvious to see if you have made something and uh, it is something that uh, very clearly known to another person, then it cannot be patented again. It will not, it will lack the inventive step. Third is the industrial application. That means it should be usable and utilizable by the industry. So the unity of invention, as I mentioned to you, it should have a, the claim should be very clear and it should be purposefully mentioned in the application. And the sufficiency of enclosure means it should be very clearly and detailedly mentioned. What is the product? Define the product. What are the features of the product, components of the product? Define that. And what is the purpose of the product? These three will have to be sufficiently disclosed. Only then you can have a patent. Now, before I go to the next step, I would like to, many people ask me, so what do I do, sir? I have to publish. Uh, otherwise, I don't get my PhD degree. Or uh, a teacher may say, 
that look, unless I publish, I will not get my next promotion. Well, there is a way about it. You make sure that your patent filing is done in such a way that uh, you can publish later on. Patent publication should precede your publication, in other words. The date of filing is very important. That particular date you file, and it'll take, uh, it used to take many years before. Nowadays, it takes only one year, two year, three year, you can get a patent. But uh, in the earlier days, I remember, people used to wait for seven or eight years before it can, you get a patent certificate. But even then, the date of filing is more important. So you can publish afterwards and there is no problem about it, one. Number two, you publish only those elements which are crucial to the research aspects. Don't disclose the know-how or the technology part, which you want to carry it to the patent office at the time of filing. So you distinct, you make a separation between the technology and the know-how or the science. The science part or engineering part you can publish. The technology part you keep it aside for the patenting. I'm just giving one example. So earlier they used to say, good old times, I'm talking about 30, 40 years ago, if you don't publish, you don't get promotion, you are not recognized, so it is a publish or perish. And now you say, if you want to patent and make good of it, publish and perish. If you publish, you perish. So you have to make sure that you patent it first before you publish. So I have suggested you some ways of how you can do both without causing any damage to your career or your uh, PhD degree, the same time maintaining the requirement for patent. Now look at one uh, very, uh, it's a very classical example. Uh, I have been talking about this uh, in many places. You would have also, those who have attended patent classes would have heard this also earlier. Uh, during my, you know, college days and all, this Polaroid uh, school days and cam, you can say, this Polaroid camera used to be very, very famous. You just put a, a photosensitive paper there, you click and the photograph comes out very quickly in a matter of a few seconds. And this almost um, people thought will completely take away the film based camera from the industry. But that did not happen anyway. And uh, this Kodak uh, company they started copying this Polaroid camera in their production manufacturing and they started marketing it. And these people in Polaroid, they sued Kodak for infringement of 12 patents and they had to pay through their nose. It is stated that they paid about 1 billion US dollars. This is the power of patent, just one example. But let me warn you, guarantee you that all patents are not like that. Some patents are not you know, as worthy as this, but still patent is a patent. Then there are a few uh, things which we cannot patent in India. I'll just go through very, very quickly. Uh, a, a frivolous invention, which has got no value whatsoever, that cannot be patented. It has to have some and uh, Sorry. For example, uh, uh, you know, you would have seen, you would have read in your younger days, perpetual motion machines, a machine which will work throughout without any input energy. Such a thing doesn't exist, it only exists in imagination, you cannot patent that. And uh, another thing is, you cannot patent something which is against the interest of the society. For example, a new type of explosive, which can be used for, let us say, bombing a place or a terrorist attack. No, you cannot patent that because it is not in the interest of society. Then a simple scientific principle which doesn't have a, a, a translation potential. 
So the application also cannot be patented. A mere discovery cannot be patented and uh, a combination of uh, many things also cannot be patented. For example, uh, you know that uh, a lot of uh, medicines are available. Um, these uh, paracetamol with a vitamin. You combine that, of course, you get a product which has got a different use. But then this use is only this one plus one, two. But if the one plus one becomes three, then it becomes a different product and it can be patented. One plus one, two cannot be patented. So duplication of uh, non-devices, for example, it was given here is an umbrella with a fan and a bucket filled with fitted and a torch because you have an umbrella and you can press one button the torch will burn and uh, another button the fan will rotate but these are all okay but there is nothing new in it we are already combining certain aspects well with the interest of time i'll proceed further And another thing is anything related to atomic energy creation. Inventions relating to atomic energy uh, cannot be patented because of strategic reasons. Now, there is another uh, important thing is IP, IP infringement. It's one thing to patent a thing, but uh, you may get a patent. But if you go to an industry, and you find that there is a problem in terms of the uniqueness of that patent, you will be infringing on somebody else's patent, then that industry will get sued for infringement. So it is very much necessary that you do a thorough patent search. It's called patent search. Okay, there are many platforms available, both online and offline, paid and non-paid which will give you an information about the different features and patents that are already available in the world and to see that you are not infringing on any patent. It's very important to see that, um, equally important to see that there is no infringement while we try to patent the product or process that you have developed through your research. Similarly, copyright infringement, trademark infringement, these are all this can be searched and found out now thanks to the variety of data that are available digitally. And this is an organization chart that we have in India for doing patent. There's a patent office. There's a, um, this comes under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry in India. And uh, there's one department under that ministry which is responsible for this. It is called DPIP or Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. And Controller General of Patent and Design Trademark is the one who is controlling it. They've got different uh, offices in um, different metropolitan cities in this country. And uh, these are some of the different types of patent applications that are available in, in the country. Um, well, we'll go to that, it's a matter of details. So these are some of the important landmark treaties which has given rise to the not only patent but the entire intellectual property regime in the world. One uh, is the creation of uh, the intellectual property organization, World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. And then you have heard about this TRIPS agreement that is for trade between countries. Now, recently, both these have been under a lot of uh, discussion, thanks to the present uh, outgoing or standing president, whichever way you look at it, of USA. He has been against the TRIPS agreement. He doesn't want the give and take uh, agreements which the World Trade Organizations have created for some reason, maybe good reason for his country, according to him. So this uh, has um, been discussed world over the last 20 years and it is still evolving. And there is another one called Paris Convention for Protection of in Industrial Property. 
And along with uh, the Paris Convention, there is also a patent cooperation treaty also signed during that time, 1998. In fact, this patent cooperation treaty, PCT, is one feature which is now available in India also. You can file along with your natural patent filing, you can file a PCT, which means you have a right over patenting in any other country for a period of two years. Within the two years, you must go and file in that country. Why? Because patent is country specific. India, China, Japan, Germany, USA, wherever you take, there is no international patent as such. It's country specific. So this patent uh, convention treaty gives you an upper hand. That means during this period of two years, your idea cannot be patented in any parts of the countries which have uh, signed this treaty. So these are the various uh, IPR domains that we have. We have discussed some of them, patents, industrial designs. In addition to that, uh, utility models, know-how, IT protection, bio biodiversity, traditional knowledge protection. These are all some of the other items that you have. Various laws which are in force in India, uh, starting from uh, 1970, the original Patent Act, which was amended in uh, during this millennium with a lot of features. One of the important features is that uh, earlier we could patent both process and product. And with the process patent, you could sell products. And this became a boon for Indian pharmaceutical industry because any patent that is available abroad, you can reverse engineer or reprocess them in a different way and market them, it was allowed. But since uh, 2005, this has been stopped. We cannot do that anymore. That means any a particular compound or a medicine or a drug which has been formulated with any process, even if it is different from the original one, cannot be sold until the patency of the original product or innovative product is over. So these are some of the offices which take care of the different IP aspects. Now, very important thing you should know uh, what are the steps in patent filing? Because this is very important. You have to file. Once you have this idea and you make the technical document, you can file this in an application form called form number one, along with uh, certain other forms like two, five, etc. as an original filing. Once you file this, you have to request for publication. That means it will uh come in the website of the registry and that becomes open to anybody to read there are people in various industries and organizations uh, who keep reading or looking at this either manually or with the help of machines to see two things one what are the new ideas that are being generated and what are the new technologies that are being used for different aspects, whether it is pharmaceutical, automobile, or mobile phones, whatever you have. And accordingly, they have to progress. They have to continue with an R&D to see that they keep abreast of uh, the technology. Second, they have to also see whether this is a copy of my original invention. Then what you can do is, you can do step three, which is called pre-grand opposition. Before the patent is granted, within three months of date of uh, examination, you can raise an opposition to the patent office. That becomes a repository with them, that becomes a document available with them. So when you ask for examination of your patent, he will look at A, all the prior art that are available with regard to your patent, B, the publications or disclosures that have been made by different parties, and three, any opposition raised by any other party on your own with respect to your patent. After examining all this, he will give you 
first examination report. That means on novelty or non-obviousness, industrial utility. If all these three are passed, he will say it, it seems to be okay. Otherwise, he will raise an objection. And you have an opportunity to reply to the first examination report within the six months of the date in which it has been raised. He may give you a three months extension if you specifically request. Uh, but uh, I think in most cases, you should be able to reply within this six months. And uh, normally, if it is very well explained, if it is due to some misunderstanding or lack of uh, uh, clarity or anything like that, they will accept it. Otherwise, they may give you another report saying that this is not acceptable. You either go back or you can still go to an appellate authority seeking um, you know, some kind of remission for this. It may be accepted, may not be accepted. If it doesn't get accepted, you can even go to High Court, Supreme Court and all that. Similar things have happened in many instances in our country and elsewhere also. So this is the uh, major steps involved. And once we have crossed this uh, step, they will grant you a patent in the form of a certificate. And uh, that's the end of it normally. But once the certificate is also given, then also within one year, a party can raise a post-grant opposition, which can be examined, but usually it will be a weak opposition as compared to the pre-grant opposition. So this is what you get at the end of the a patent certification. Now, how, what do you do with this patent? Okay, you got a patent. I just frame it in the nice frame and put it on the wall. It has no purpose served. So you can utilize this patent in many ways. One, you have to make sure that is assigned to a party or reassigned to a party. For instance, recently, you know, there was a news about CET getting a patent. It's name of CET itself. That means it is assigned to CET. Now, CET in its wisdom can design, decide to reassign it to another party. Why they should do it, I'll come to that. For instance, you have decided to transfer that technology to a company, another company. And that company says, no, I will take the technology provided you reassign the patent to me. Then only I will take it. And uh, you can either agree or disagree. If you agree, then it becomes a reassignment. Second is transfer. That's also similar to reassigning. The only, only difference is that uh, it, it goes as a part of the technology transfer in case you wish to. Otherwise, it becomes only a license for a period of certain years. This license can be exclusive. That means it is given to only one party. It cannot be given to any other party. It can be non-exclusive also. It can, same technology or a patent can be given to more than one organization or industry, then it becomes non-exclusive. And as you uh, all by now realize, it is uh, valid for 20 years, subject to renewal fees in the country of registration. All countries, most countries have 20 years at the time. And what after that? Well, you have if needed, if you feel that there is a potential for filing this patent in another country, another foreign country, then you have to do the uh, PCT within 13 months. And the country specific patent also has to be filed in 24 months. And uh, usually you do this country specific patent because in India, patent filing is very, very cheap compared to any other country. And if you had to go to uh, USA or any European country and all that, it is usually 10 times what you have to pay for patent in India. So you will have to keep the market in mind. Do you really intend to market this technology or a product using this technology in that place? That CET cannot decide, obviously. If you have transferred it to an industry, that industry will decide, yes, 
this is of interest to me this country is of interest to me then you can think of doing this otherwise there's no use spending so much money uh, in filing patent in other countries now uh, the pur whole purpose of uh, the talking today was to arrive at this slide we are all carrying out research and development research means studies experiments and all that development means you are coming out with a technology a process a product or something a service which can be used by mankind this particular thing has to be validated experimentally and uh, from the you know, from the point of view of a user user validation experimental validation once you are satisfied with that then you can do a pilot run you you have a prototype at this stage you make 100 prototypes that is called piloting and you can do a test marketing if you like to see whether it works and then you will get a feedback okay this part is not okay that is not okay you can scale it up and you can do the marketing this is the whole process which is called chain of innovation and I'll just give you a few one or two examples let's take the, take the case of uh, medicine a drug you can do it is nothing you know synthesizing a chemical entity is not a big issue you can synthesize one or two chemicals you make admixture them or react them and get a particular compound you have a pharmaceutical product now validating it means you have to test it you have to you have to test it in vitro that means in, inside the laboratory you take a tissue or you take some uh, membrane or something and see whether the reactions are taking place according to what you want if it works then you have to take it for animal testing you may do testing on rats you may do testing on some other animals higher mammals as it is as required by the uh, regulatory authority and once you pass that you have to apply for human trials you have now everybody is now familiar thanks to the vaccine you have to take it to the human level that also can be tried only after the regulatory organization or fda approves trial on human beings you will approve only based on the data that you provide with your laboratory test as well as the animal test if it is satisfactory and you can you do it on human that is a big job this is not something which we do in cet or any academic institution or any research institution this can happen only when the industry steps in so you must have an eye on this when you are doing this only then you can go here leave alone scale up and marketing so it's a big journey don't think that uh, we do a research today 3 years you do research you come up with a publication or a patent and tomorrow it becomes an industrial product it doesn't happen that way it's a long journey and we should have the you know the stamina pain patience and that is one of the important thing that you need to have and which is why my original slide of funding agencies become very relevant you must have a funding which is there for 3 years 5 years once that project is over you we'll take it to the next level of validation for that also you must have funding so you carry out this and the 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 pivotal person here is not the student alone but the the faculty member also he must have a long term plan he must think that today i am developing a screw but this screw is meant for a final product which will be a robo now you should think from the screw to the robo level and the time taken the funding requirement the science requirement how many phds and mtech theses it may not be one so this kind of a journey is what we have to every uh, researcher has to plan to see that the chain of innovation takes place innovation is not only ideation ideation takes place somewhere here creativity takes place here you just because you have got a fantastic idea good 
you will end up with a publication and you will remain here only. You will not proceed further. So this is uh, uh, the main takeaway from what I wanted to talk here. And once you do that and you have a repository, now the two options. One is based on the market requirement, we can push the technology to the society. The other is there is a demand from the market for such a product. So they, they, will try, they will try to pull your knowledge from that. And this is done through uh, proof of concept, invention prototyping, detailed design, and production. And these all things can be done only with the industry. This is why uh, I keep telling the young researchers that this stage itself, you must have an industry with you, a relevant industry with you, who can give you ideas. It's not that at the end of a three year or four year research by one research scholar, the product should be there. It can be a beginning. It can, and another parallel research or the next stage serial research can take you to the next step. So that the chain of innovation is created and maintained. So that's all I wanted to talk to you today. Thank you for your attention. And I'm very, very happy to take any questions. Students can ask questions now. Who will be the first one, right? Yeah, there's a starting trouble. <laughs> okay. There is a question that appears on my screen. Um, it has vanished now. Is uh, whether publishing or patent, which is better? I think that was the question, am I right? Um, see, there is nothing <clears throat> like uh, which is better and which is not better. Both have their own places. It depends upon where you want to be. If you are a theoretical physicist, obviously you don't patent anything. You don't make any artifact by creating general theory of relativity. When Einstein didn't get any patent for general theory of relativity, he got patent for a photoelectric effect. So there, what will benefit you is publication. And there can be, uh, even in engineering, there can be fundamental engineering also, so though it's actually uh, kind of uh, oxymoron to say that in the fundamental engineering, engineering is actually applied all the time. But still there could be some fundamental principles based on uh, which major artifacts can be created. So such things which you feel cannot result in a patent immediately, you publish. But where you see a potential to patent, which can have further potential for technology transfer to an industry with further potential to commercialization, revenue generation, wealth creation, employment generation, profit creation, you must patent.
that is my brief answer you yes, can uh, unmute and ask if you like yeah sandeep you can ask uh, there is one question again how can we do process patenting same formality as patent uh, filing only process patenting product patenting uh, both are same same formality the only thing is a process patenting doesn't result in a product itself the same product you can have a different process which may be say a cost cutting measure or which could be an environmentally better method and uh, this it will not uh, appear so when you see the product the product may look same with the different product process patenting also the only difference is that you have to keep it uh, somewhat confidential within that company or industry which is manufacturing the product and uh, if you see or come to know that somebody else is using the same product process then you can sue him otherwise there is no other benefit to it this and the question which immediately came and vanished i couldn't read it yes yeah, sir the question is uh, in improvement of a technology how can novelty and non obviousness be proved see <clears throat> improvement uh, if you are adding something very different from what was done earlier resulting in a totally different performance a totally different feature then it can be patented there is a different utility also in that uh, process then it can be patented but if it is only an incremental we used to call it called uh, patenting around such things are not allowed now so what the question was right that incremental progress or improvement in technologies are very difficult to be patented unless you prove that is substantially different Yes, sir. The next question was: Is it possible to obtain patent for software-related invention? No, you cannot uh, get patent for software. However, you can get a copyright uh, for that software. Can an idea be patented? No, idea cannot be patented because idea is only maybe it may pass the novelty. component sometimes but the non obviousness the industrial utility all that must also happen for the patent to take place yeah sir anjan uh, here so uh, one my question was regarding the technology transfer part yeah so uh, we, you have mentioned four types of uh, uh, how to do a technology transfer that is <clears throat> you uh, either assign you transfer it or you assign it or you license it so uh, what would be how to select the best strategy for a given product okay um <clears throat> these four types of uh, patent handling need not be always applied for a technology transfer you can always transfer a technology only simply by licensing it that should be your first uh, uh, attempt suppose ct has a patent now this patent is already there for a electric vehicle which you have don't give that patent to anyone don't assign it reassign it transfer it or give it away but license it to another company for use for a certain period of time as agreed upon there will be an agreement usually 
that will be sometimes as long as the vehicle is in the market by that industry or 20 years of patent because after that any other company can also use it. Therefore, you limit it to the 20 years of the patent life or any other period mutually decided by both parties. So it's a simple licensing. You will get royalty on that. Once you normally, once you transfer the technology, it's like selling of the technology. That you should never do it because uh, much uh, <clears throat> you'll like to know that even if the royalty is only 2%, 3%, normally up to 5%, that is a cumulative, it has got a cumulative effect. It will give you a revenue stream on itself. Whereas if you transfer it, you may get say one crore rupees, but then one crore stops there. And after 10 years, the value of one crore is only one lakh rupees. So it's always better to have the royalty factor built in through licensing. But there may be very, very uh, rare instances where the industry wants to you know, take that patent itself. Okay, you value it and give it to him. In a way, it's also good because you don't have to give the renewal fees and all those kinds of things, everything, maintenance of the patent, everything you look after. But you extract the right amount of fees for reassigning it to them. So both options are possible. So one more question I have. So yeah. regarding a, a, a technology transfer, uh, uh, what would be, how do you uh, select the, or how do you estimate the right price? Or how do you understand the market value of an invention and it's a product patent? Yeah, it's a very good question. And um, I don't think so far anybody has been able to answer it satisfactorily enough because there are several methodologies and formulas and actuarial calculations that people have done. But in reality, these things do not happen the way we wish. For example, one simple way to calculate would be, let us assume that you spend around say 10 lakh rupees on this project. The intellectual cost of that project is your own inputs. The student, the faculty, the staff, you put another five lakhs to it, 10 lakhs. Then you look at the novelty and the utility, if it is very high on the scale, you make it three times. So that becomes, let's say 15 into three, 45. If it is low, you give it 1.5, so 2025. So this 2025 lakh or 50 lakhs, I'm just giving an example, it could be even crores, depending upon the type of projects and all that. You have to see, normally no industry will give you all the money upfront. He will give you a small fees upfront. He will give you an upfront fee of, let's say two lakhs, five lakhs and he will give you the rest in the form of royalty. That depends upon the number of pieces that he sells, number of uh, um, countries that he sells, etc. So we'll get a portion of that as royalty. And another way is that you calculate the amount of turnover the industry will make based on a market uh, appreciation or the amount of profit that he gets. And you want a share of that. So you calculate that. So that could be, you can say 1% of uh, the turnover or 10 percentage of the profit on the total volume sold over the next 10 years or 20 years that you have to decide what is the life cycle of this product. And you find out the number of pieces that this product may sell in the market. Do a calculation bring it to the next net, net present value and you divide it into upfront fee and royalty and calculate that. So a lot of calculation is involved. But I'm saying, what I was saying is in spite of all this 
and uh, calculation. That too, assuming that there is a lot of market information available with you, it may not be there. I'll give you one example. In 90s, early 90s, um, you know, I was in Delhi and traveling and all that. So whenever I used to go outside, you know, by road, travel somewhere, I used to feel in North India, I used to find it very difficult drinking water. You know, they never used to taste good, leave alone hygiene and other things. So I was forced to drink Coke, Coca-Cola or Pepsi or whatever was available. There was no mineral water available. And that is when Bisleri introduces mineral water. When they introduced the mineral water there, Bisleri, it was called Bisleri, Parley. People are, it was costing 10 rupees a liter. People were asking in Delhi at 10 rupees, one liter of milk was available. Who will buy this water when one liter of milk is available for the same price? But he stood. And today you see what happened? It is selling like hotcakes, isn't it? And he sold it for 200 crores to another company. So that is the power of uh, novelty if you have a good marketing strategy. So you cannot predict, but at the same time, if you do a reasonably good prediction and come out to you know some kind of a very often, let me tell you, a back of the envelope calculation will suffice. You make, make sure that you get a, at least whatever you spend on the project, product return over the next 10 to 20 years time. That's for the calculation purpose. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think there are two questions in the chat box. Yeah. Are patent databases of different countries common? Assume that invention is patent in each somewhere possible to help. Okay. Uh, with uh, small variations here and there, lot of things are common in many countries because there's a certain amount of harmonization that has taken place during the last 20 to 30 years, thanks to activities of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. They sit together like just like UN and they have tried to harmonize many things and uh, many things have now become common. Still, there are some differences. For example, in US, you can get a patent for a new application, new utilization of the same product. Whereas in India, this is not available now. So that is one major difference with the US and Indian patent. So barring such few things, the fees, uh, things can vary. The frequency of payment of fees can vary. Certain processes can be different. Let's be the opposition that you, that period can vary. The way in which the appellate authorities function can vary. But overall, it is more or less same. I hope uh, that answers. The second one is, uh, suppose we did an extensive patent search before filing, but before awarding somebody finds an infringement. Before filing. Before awarding. Yeah, that is, uh, he finds an infringement means he will raise an opposition. So the patent is not granted yet. It has only been filed. He will raise an opposition. And uh, if you find that the infringement, the patent office finds that this infringement is a valid claim, then he will disallow this patent and write to you that it seems that you are infringing on somebody else's patent. Please answer. If you don't answer satisfactorily, it will be rejected. Your patent filing will be rejected. Do you feel patenting? of a socially useful technology that is public for their innovation and utilization to an extent. See, um, the purpose of patenting itself is to make it socially useful. Now, if you simply patent it and it's not converted into industrial use, then there is a problem. See, it has happened also, especially in Western universities, you come out with a good uh, 
product patent and some industry notices that uh, this product is a, a villain for his own already running product if it comes to the market his product original product will suffer the best thing to do for him will be to buy this product and keep it in the shelf so that nobody else will market it so that way it can be socially not become useful so that is why you will uh, put in a clause in your agreement always that if this product is not marketed within 2 years or whatever period it will stand the agreement will stand cancelled there is two reason for writing this one is that your patent is not being used for the purpose that means making it socially relevant or useful second you don't get any royalty if it doesn't sell so for both these reasons you decide that the agreement will become null and void after a agreed period 2 years or 3 years or whatever it is that is one thing regarding the socially useful part i do not know whether that was the intention of the questioner and uh, one more thing i would like to add see there is something called compulsory licensing uh, in india it has been applied there is a provision for this compulsory licensing in wipo but no country has utilized it uh, to my knowledge other than india this was done in the case of the cancer drug by novartis and uh, they were selling it at a very high price in india not affordable there was actually it was not being sold because it was unaffordable and they were not transferring it to anybody else here so the controller of patents decided to do a compulsory licensing to one of the indian companies of course they were paid they went to court also supreme court finally supreme court also granted in favor of controller of patent and this compulsory licensing that is done because of the the severity of that product not being available because it is for a cancer treatment so in such a situation there is a provision for compulsory licensing also in the patent regime i think with that the question should uh, get answered fully yeah we are coming to the fag end of the program any faculty do uh, do you want to ask any questions I mean if the faculty are doing active research so maybe one one or two questions final questions from the faculty members Okay, so I think uh, no more questions. So I think we can wind up the <clears throat> session. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, so uh, so now uh, we'll conclude the uh, the session. So so let me uh, first of all. Uh, thank from the bottom of my heart dr k r s krishnan sir for giving us a, such a wonderful lecture and as he himself termed it was more he wanted instead of a talk he wanted it this to be as more of a discussion with the students and uh, to the, all the participants uh, i would like to thank them that saying uh, see dr krishnan actually came for we, we did not had to invite he himself came forward and offered this talk and uh, no krishna sir as many of the phd scholars know he is also the chairman in many of the dc me meetings and he is very active with the uh, alumni work in our cet and in spite of a uh, lot of other engagements he was very much uh, interested and uh, wanted to talk uh, wanted to discuss with the students on this technology transfer especially with the pg scholars and uh, <clears throat> uh, research scholars so uh, so let me thank uh, dr k r s krishnan for this wonderful lecture and uh, <clears throat> i would also like to thank our principal dr g g sevi for giving us permission 
to conduct this session. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sinduji, the Dean Research, CET, for co-coordinating this uh, program. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Jayasri, the CETA Secretary, for making all the provisions for today's Zoom talk. Okay. I also thank Dr. Srilada Ji, the technical officer, for the uh, for uh, con for helping me conduct this program. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Mr. Manu, uh, S3 electrical engineering student, who helped me with the postering and other other works. And uh, I lastly but not least, all the faculty members and my dear student friends. So thank you very much. Uh, for accepting our invite and attending this session. So we had a very good participation. More than 122 students were there and we were able to retain a very large number of students till the end. So that is that speaks volume of, that, of today's session. So thank you all and thank you uh, once again, Trishnan sir. So have a great day. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you all for inviting me and your great attention. And, uh... Um, definitely, you can continue the interaction with me through Dr. Anjan. If any more questions or any help required, I'll be most happy to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.